Hey y'all, it's Kara with Goat Fort Farm, and today we are going to talk about kind of a difficult topic, but a very necessary one if you're thinking about getting animals, having a small homestead or farm, and that is what I think is the hardest part of farming. Whatever scale that you're at, obviously ours is kind of small scale, um, but let's talk about the hardest part of farming. I don't know about you, but for me, the hardest thing about life in general, let alone farming, is you can only control so much. I always want to be able to control everything and that can be overwhelming at times because we know that in like real life and in farm life, that just doesn't work out. You can have a plan and I think it's great to have a plan. You need to have a plan. But even with a solid plan, even with researching before you do something, sometimes there's factors that are just completely out of your control and that's okay. What's important is that you're doing the best by your animals and trying to learn from when you do make mistakes because it's gonna happen. So let's go back in time to some of our very early on homesteading mistakes that we made here. Uh, and talk about what we've done since those, and then we'll come back over here with the turkeys. One of the very first things that we learned when we started getting animals was you can't just have everybody together and able to access each other's feed. For example, we have goats and chickens. Well, that's what we started out with anyways. First we had chickens and then we added some goats. And so we had our chicken coop and this part right here was not yet there. And we just had our chicken coop and feed was out all the time and they could walk in and out, the chickens could, and get the feed. But when we got goats, um, goats first of all, they don't have what is called self-control. They will overindulge themselves, especially on grain. And so whether it's goat feed or chicken feed or whatever, you cannot let goats just eat and eat and eat. Otherwise, they'll eat so much that they'll bloat and that can actually lead to death. This is what we did to keep our chickens able to go in and out of their coop while keeping the goats out. And this has worked for keeping the little goats, like the babies, out as well. So if you look at the bottom here, and maybe one of them will demonstrate for us. Can you show us how you use your coop? Or how you use the door? But uh, that gap that is under there, the chickens can go under it or they can go over the gate also. And the goats, however, cannot. <laughs> so that's how we solve that problem. I'm hoping one of them will go under there actually. Will one of y'all go under? Another thing, uh, just if you happen to have goats, is uh, you're gonna want locks that you have to have a thumb to use. Uh, we used to have these locks without the part that slides uh, that you have to actually pull on. And some of our goats, especially Oreo, who is very devious and intelligent, she would just knock those off and go right in. So be aware of that. Um, animals are smart. And well, that's, that's a part of the fun challenge, I guess. One issue that we ran into really early was predators. And that's one reason that we have these big livestock guardian dogs. So over here we have Scout, who is usually hanging out with the bucks, but he's gonna go out today because we just moved the does over to graze on our side for a bit. Because the vegetation over here is crazy. So let's talk about, 
what led us into getting livestock guardian dogs. Come on, Scout. You ready, boy? All right, be good. Keep everybody safe today. They're like, uh, where's our friend going? <laughs> so, predators out here, we've, we've got a lot of them. There are coyotes, um, foxes, owls. We've got raccoons, possums, and while most of those predators, well, and skunks, don't forget skunks. Um, while most of those predators aren't gonna do anything to a goat, or even a baby goat. Oh, hey, Scout, you joining us? What they can disrupt are baby birds. And, you know, we've got chickens, and now we have turkeys also. And so you've got to think about all of your animals, the predators that are present. And unfortunately, we learned that lesson. Well, and maybe fortunately, we learned that lesson quickly. So I also use this netting, uh, this electric netting too, to help the goats focus on certain areas. If you look in our yard, it is crazy. You want to come in here, Scout? I'll open it if you want to go in. Here, come on, Scout. You want to come in? You might want to mark around it. That's fine. That would probably be better even. So uh, I have this electric netting and it's solar powered so we can move the goats around. And yeah, the vegetation over on my side is crazy. Like machinery probably couldn't even do well out here because the ground is so soft. Oh, get back Franklin. Don't touch it. You will not like that. Will any of y'all dare to touch it? Surely not. Oh, Franklin just got it when I wasn't looking at him. They learn really quick uh, to respect the fence. So let's talk about some predators we've encountered out here and what we learned from it. So the first goat or goat I ever had were Rocky and his brother. Um, we bought them and they were pretty cheap, not registered, not purebred, just some first pet goats, just to get into goats. Because we knew that, well, goats would stop eating my legs, would be a good animal for the type of terrain that we have here. And his brother was so sweet. His name was Brownie. And so we had Rocky and Brownie. And um, we had gotten a few additional goats after that. We got Oreo, Gazelle, and another goat named uh, Betty. Oh, do not knock that over, please, Gazelle, as I'm talking about you. So one day, um, Oreo, Rocky, and Brownie were all out grazing, and only uh, Rocky and Oreo came back, and they were so, like, upset. They were not themselves. They seemed like they were in shock. They were acting weird. And Brownie was nowhere to be seen. We drove all the way, all around the farm and were looking for him, calling for him, shaking feed. And no matter what we did, um, he just was gone. And so even to this day, like we never found any remains or anything. But we assume that it had to have been like a coyote or something, something that got him. And he was a small goat. I'll show you a picture of him here. Um, and it was just, it was really tragic because um, we didn't think anything would come that close to the house. But it did. Um, and we learned our lesson. Shortly after that, we were looking for a livestock guardian dog, and we ended up getting Shiloh, who is our female livestock guardian dog, and she tends to stay around the weathers, the roaming herd the most, um, and she's been an amazing animal. With her active and like as an adult out to be um, out and with the herd, we have not had a loss of an animal um, or of a goat. Um, and so she's been an amazing asset to our herd. Can you stop licking my salt, please? They think I'm a mineral block. They get minerals, I promise. Um, but yeah. And then two years after having Shiloh, we decided that 
um, it'd be good to have another livestock guardian dog that could spend more time with the bucks and um, on our side because we purchased this part of the property. And so we got Scout and um, ah, they've been an excellent duo for us. Also, honey here, we blood test our goats for CL, CAE, and Yonis, our breeding stock. We test them. And honey came back positive um, for Yonis, which is a horrible, horrible disease that basically causes animals to starve to death even though they are eating. And we looked at honey and we're like, um, honey is a thick girl. We don't see how that could be possible. So we kept her and we did a, the m most accurate test you can do for Yonis is a fecal test. So we decided, no, honey does not look like she has Yonis. There's no way she has the count that they're saying she does. And uh, had her tested with, had her um, feces tested and lo and behold, she actually didn't have it. So, and we blood tested her since then through the same uh, place we tested her before and she had that false positive and she's negative. So, needless to say, sometimes you can't control the result of tests, but you can test again and that's okay. On the flip side of that, sometimes you do test your animals and a bad result comes back. When we started having uh, goats, one of the first goats we got with um, Oreo and Gazelle was a doe, a young doe uh, that we named Betty. And that was um, a doe that Gazelle was really bonded with. And um, unfortunately, she did develop CL. And we don't have any other goats that have CL. We've tested, none of them have it. Um, but she was completely unrelated to the herd and she had CL. And wh what that is, is basically the goats will get an infection in their lymph nodes where their lymph nodes will swell so much that they actually burst externally, or maybe it can happen internally too. And it can live in the soil for years, I think, and it's just debilitating to the animals who have it. So we did end up having to put her down, which was a difficult decision, but it was the best decision for our herd because uh, none of the other animals were able to contract it. <laughs> um, and, you know, we don't have to worry about it in our herd. We test for it and we're very careful about testing the animals that we breed. Oh, <laughs> Dottie slapped her ear on my knee. And I think that's like the best practice is like, hey, sometimes things are gonna come up you did not plan for. It's what you do with that information. A more recent case of that has come with Ice Ivory's papa, who is uh, Rocky Road. So while she's chilling over here, let's go talk about Rocky Road. So Rocky Road, he is um, not Rocky, but Rocky Road there. He, um, we originally got him with our other buck, Confetti Bomb, and he had no known issues. He looked amazing, but he ended up um, within the past year developing a horrible limp that's gotten a lot better since he's been free ranging. Anyways, that is what they call uh, carpal hyperextension, and they aren't sure why Nigerian dwarfs are developing it. Now, it's highly likely that it's genetic, but again, not something you can know an animal has for like the first three years of life. An animal might not show any symptoms at all, and then bam, they've, they're showing symptoms suddenly um, when they turn three or are close to three. So that's kind of a scary thing, and that's why we chose to make Rocky Road a weather. We banded him using a California bander, and now he just gets to roam with the herd and help us take care of this lush vegetation. Honey, you look so content. There's Trixie, Tootsie, 
How many goats can you see in this brush? <laughs> oh, well, I, there's one that's easy to see. She's not even trying to forage. Hey, baby bell, um, I'm going to need you to go back to work, please. Okay, well, um, before my legs get <laughs> eaten, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get out of this pen, and I'll meet y'all back at where the turkeys are. Now, coming back over here to the turkeys, <sighs> unfortunately, we did lose one of our little baby heritage turkeys. And this kind of ties into the situation with our former buck, Rocky Road, in that you can't control the health, like the innate health and <laughs> genetic. All the turkeys, they want the camera attention. Hello, I'm trying to explain something serious here. Anyways, I'll just keep talking. You can't control when an animal is born with a impairment, a health impairment. Um, you can try and limit those. For example, with Rocky Road, our uh, buck that's now a weather and obviously can't reproduce, we ensured that he couldn't pass that on anymore. Well, our little baby turkey that passed away, who I'd been calling Tiny, it was about half the size of all of our other uh, baby turkeys. And while all of these turkeys are constantly paying attention to that world around them and exploring that, uh, eating bugs, walking around, and just like, they're not focused on themselves. And this baby turkey, Tiny, it stayed kind of hunched up. Its feathers didn't look right for its body. And it just stuck out like a sore thumb among the other turkeys. And there's some conditions in turkeys where it stunts their growth. And that can be due to a malabsorption issue, or it could just be that one of their organs or maybe many of their organs were underdeveloped and just couldn't keep up with their body. Uh, and I think that's what's happened here. And at the end of the day, Tiny was on a totally different level from where the rest of the turkeys are at. And um, I guess I'm just happy that it didn't really suffer. It was kind of not developing further for a couple of weeks, but it was hanging in there and I thought, well, maybe it's just got smaller genetics somehow, but um, it just, it just didn't continue to develop. So I think it had an innate issue and thankfully the rest of the birds are doing great and continuing to really grow and thrive. So my takeaway from that is don't beat yourself up over things that you can't control whether it's health or the fact that you can't have your animals in a truly closed system or unless you farm in a lab that has no um anything external coming to it and so like just do the best that you can by your animals stay connected in groups uh, Facebook groups, like, I don't really like using Facebook regularly, but Facebook groups have been phenomenal. My goodness. And <laughs> stay connected with other people, like, in your community. Talking with other people nearby that have goats has been amazing for me. Um, when I was, especially when I was just getting started with them. And so, get connected. Don't beat yourself up. And always try and improve what you're doing. Sometimes you'll try something you think is a great idea and it does not work out at all. And that's okay. Because sometimes you might try something that other people think is a horrible idea and it works great for your system. So keep your head up uh, and just be willing to roll with the punches and um, learn, always stay learning. Um, and don't forget, you know what we say here. If you have a dream, go for it. Bye, y'all.